Welcome to The Art of Liberty, the unauthorized radical libertarian podcast with George Donnelly and John Tyner. If you want to maximize your freedom in the real world today, this is the podcast for you. Today is Monday, July 1st, 2013, and our topic today is, Are Libertarians Too Selfish? How are you, John? our topic last week? (laughs) Yeah, I know. I'm sure that uh, our regular listeners are like, huh? (laughs) And yeah, that that was our, this was our intended topic for last week, but um, we got off into that other topic. Yeah. Yeah. But to answer your question, I'm doing good. How are you? Oh, that's great. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, I feel good as well. Awesome. <laughs> hey, so I didn't mention it last week when we were talking, but we were talking about our kids, and you mentioned your son Clark um, washes his hand and tends to make a giant mess when he does that. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I was a little embarrassed to say so at the time, but that's how I wash my hands. Is there a better <laughs> way to do it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, what I do is I grab the soap first. And I, okay. so, and I, cause it's liquid soap okay. and, I, and I soap up my hands and it's really dry. I mean, the soap is really dry. And then I, and then I turn on the water and I, uh, get the hands wet and then the soap, you know, really activates. And so and then I really work up the lather and that way I don't, I don't drip water outside the, uh, the sink. <laughs> yeah. I was say for those, for those who missed it, George was talking about his son last week and saying that he gets his hands wet first, then moves his hands over to the soap and gets his, uses the soap. And in the process of doing that drips a bunch of water all over the sink. And so drives his wife parent, crazy apparently. But yeah, I was listening to you talk about that and I was sitting there thinking to myself, I do it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, some sink designs are better than others. The one that I have here is very, uh, you know, it's like a tiny sink and then it's flat all around and there's no, it, it's not angled for the water to drain back in. Oh, okay. uh, maybe, maybe yours is angled to drain back in. No, it's not. I just make a big mess and use a towel and clean it up afterwards. <laughs> uh, hey, so did you um, did you want to talk about that conversation with uh, Joe Blow? Um, I haven't read that in a while, um, but it seemed like you did a pretty good job. It's you know, he just it seemed like he didn't have a real good concept of anarchy, at least at the time you were talking to him in those comments. Yeah, a uh, a gentleman was commenting on our. Um, on our page at aymfl.com slash taol and uh i don't know why more people haven't commented there <laughs> <laughs> and uh basically it was it was kind of nice for me uh even though you know it wasn't you know the kind of conversation where you know everybody's like yeah you're right yeah you're right you know because um basically this is like a, a person who doesn't really know very much about uh, libertarianism. And so those are the most refreshing conversations to have, I think, because it's, you know, it's coming from a totally new perspective um, or a totally uninitiated perspective. It's kind of like in Aikido uh, when, uh, you know, when you get used to training Aikido, you get used to your partner uh, kind of moving to accommodate uh, the technique that you're doing. And so when a new person comes into the class, and they don't know how to move, you you really find out whether your technique is working or not. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, he, so he, you know, he had a few questions um, about, um, you know, the, uh, you know, what we've been talking about. And perhaps one of the most interesting ones, he says, um, to create a voluntary non-exploitative society, because that's what I said that I was interested in, Every person in that society has to be non-exploitative. And people will only stay non-exploitative as long as resources are plentiful. Okay. So what, do you th- what do you think? So basically saying, you know, as long as everything's hunky-dory, everything's going to stay hunky-dory. But when it goes, when it goes off plan, you know, every, it's going to be, you know, monkeys uh, meeting with cats in the streets. Uh, you know. <laughs> So I, I, it turns out that I do know this person, so I'm gonna, I'm going to try and speak for him a little bit. I don't want to say exactly who he is. Um, I don't want to overstep my bounds here, but it turns out I know him, so I'm going to try and speak for him a little bit. And I don't think he was saying monkeys and cats are going to be mating in the street. <laughs> um, but I think he does have a very um, Hobbesian world view that it's basically, you know, 
all everybody against everybody else. And as soon as resources run out, it's going to become chaos in the streets and people are just going to fight each other for whatever it is that they need. Yeah. Monkeys um, and cats. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, I tend to disagree with that just because, um, I think, um, it doesn't make sense for people to do that. And I think in the long term, people understand that fighting with each other, nobody's going to win or, you know, it's not a good long term strategy. Yeah. Um, so we, I think, he, I think he's right in the short term, you know, there's probably going to be crime in the streets, people fighting each other for food and water. But I think in a relatively short period of time, people are going to find some kind of solution to that problem and start working together to solve it. Well, I'm not even convinced that, 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 you know, that's necessarily going to happen. You know, that people are going to even be fighting over food and water. Um, you know, I think by nature, we are cooperative people and even the, um, Stanley Milgram experiment, you know, where they, uh, you know, had people encouraging people off the street basically to torture, um, you know, other people they didn't even know. Uh, one of the conclusions from that was that basically the people who, who did that, who did those sadistic things in that experiment, uh, and you can Google that, it's the Milgram experiment, M-I-L-G-R-A-M, were doing it because they were cooperative in nature and they wanted to cooperate. Um, not necessarily because they were sadistic evil bastards. Yeah, yeah. And for to this gentleman who who posted uh, the comment, I said, you know, you can, you know, this the monkeys and cats things. Well, you can tell that to the people, uh, you know, in Japan who, after the F Fukushima earthquake, uh, patiently queued up for assistance. You know, they got. I mean, the. It was just rubble. I mean, it was like another nuclear bomb went off practically there. And, you know, these people were killing each other for, for drops of water. They they lined up. They lined right. up, you know. And tell it to the people after the, uh, you know, 2004 tsunami in, um, you know, in Thailand principally and um, where people helped each other. I mean, that that was another terrible, you know, disaster scenario. And it was almost even – it was even almost on a desert island. <laughs> Yeah, um, well, to, to, and people to play, helped each other in a big yeah, way. To, and, yeah, to play to play devil's advocate a little bit though, doesn't the Milgram experiment experiment essentially show that people are going to be lining up to um, act in the stead of whatever government decides it needs to be in control of the food and the water supply so that it can ration it out? Well, it's hard to say. It's possible, and maybe you know it should be uh, rationed out in a disaster scenario, but. You know, not imposed from above necessarily, but on a cooperative basis, you know, where people are making the decisions together. Perhaps, but I think that the argument's going to be that the Milgram experiment shows that people are going to be cooperative, whether that means they've got to do horrible things to other people or not. They're going to, you know, there's certain people who think there needs to be some kind of central authority to deal with this kind of stuff. Well, and, and, a, and that's I not think necessarily it's our bad. Them, a central authority not is not. The central authority is not necessarily bad as long as it is, uh, you know, voluntary and non-exploitative. Yeah, well, yeah. It depends on where that authority derives from, right? Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think I think you know, there's going to be some group of people who think they ought to be in charge, and there's going to be another group of people who think that they're not necessarily wrong and are happy to line up to help them do what they want to do because they want to be cooperative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm. That's not necessarily bad. I mean, it just needs to be, you know, kept legitimate and under control. Yeah, I'm just saying I don't think you're going to convince this person for exactly the reasons I just laid out. Oh, I don't need to convince him. <laughs> I just need him to step aside and let me be free. That's all. <laughs> well, I think he's probably I think he's probably willing to do that as long as people will leave him alone. Well, no, mm -mm. no. Yeah, I, I, that's always it's always funny. There's some libertarians who are like, I just want people to leave me alone, and that's why you know I'm kind of like, okay, so are you gonna go, uh, you know, get a shack out in like uh, the Arctic Circle in Alaska, and you know, just live up there all by yourself? I mean, what's this leave me alone stuff? I mean, yeah, the, the rugged individualism as it's referred to. Yeah, I mean, th that's like, you know. No, I mean, people don't leave each other alone. I mean, it doesn't mean that I, that they're going to control each other, but uh, leave me alone is such an extremist position. It's almost like an overreaction, I think. 
Yeah, because... I mean, I think he does have he he definitely does want to live on a plot of land out in the middle of nowhere, and for the most part, be left alone. But I don't think that's exactly what he means. I think he means more in the governmental sense than anything else. Mm-hmm. So yeah, basically, want... not so much as "don't leave me alone" as "don't interfere with me" kind of thing. <laughs> Well, Which you know, I suppose kind of sounds the same. You kind of got to read into that, I guess, a little bit. Yeah, and I, it's always funny when people are like, you know, don't interfere with my Medicare benefits and don't interfere with that <laughs> foreign war that I'm cheering on TV and leave me alone while uh, I support the NSA that wires is wiretapping everybody. And don't you dare interfere with my support of those foreign wars where the drones are killing the kids, you know? <laughs> right. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, don't I, interfere with my interfering. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, just, just don't. I'm kicking this kid, this kid's ass. You know, just don't interfere with me. <laughs> I got it all by myself. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So even I, you know, I like to, you know, to give, you know, everybody who gives us a little feedback, I like to give them a little, um, a little time. You know, even if, even if they disagree or, you know, or whatever. You know, I just, I like yeah. to honor all, all. All the people who come and say, you know, give some kind of feedback on the show because I, I appreciate yeah. that, even when it's, um, even when you know you disagree. Yeah. Hey. So um, before we move on, I wanted to mention we had a listener who wrote in and explained his thoughts about my backpack dilemma last week. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't want to beat this thing to death, but I thought about this this week, and I'm not. I think he's right about the proportionality response. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that that makes sense. Um, but in my particular case, the reason I didn't care for it is if cutting that guy's lock is not proportional to him tying up my backpack the way he did, there's really no alternative for me, which is why I didn't like that at the time. What do you mean? There's no alternative, no, no alternative. Well, there was no, there was no way for me to retrieve my backpack at the time. So, I mean, aside, if I wasn't able to be a nice guy and just kind of let it sit there until he finally came back. There's really no recourse for me except to wait for him to come back. Hmm. So yeah. that that was the reason I didn't like it. So I I, want, I was kind of curious, you know, does does the proportionality become does the response become more and more reasonable the longer time passes or the more things I've tried before cutting the guy's lock? Hmm. Perhaps. So I, I don't know. It's yeah. it's a question, I suppose, either for this listener or anybody else who wants to chime in. I mean, this thing's we've been talking about this for six or eight weeks now, so I don't want to beat it to death. I just it's an interesting <laughs> thing that actually happened to me. So, like I said, I just kind of gave it some more thought this week. Although perhaps it's just a uh, you know turn the other cheek moment kind of a thing. Yeah, and th- and that's what happened. I was just it seems like there ought to be some kind of solution to that for me to be able to get my backpack. I don't want to say backpack back, and I was doing so well at avoiding saying it. <laughs> but it seems like there ought to be some way for me to retrieve it short of just doing nothing. You know, something something to me just doesn't seem right about that in the legalistic sense. Hmm. Yeah, you know, maybe you could, you know, stick a crowbar in there and bend the uh, the top of it a little bit, but then that yeah. would be damaged to a third party, right? Right, which is I was absolutely trying to avoid. Yeah. So yeah, I'm not sure there's a good solution, but if somebody has one, then I'd be interested in hearing it. Hmm. Hey, uh, one one last little thing before we get into the main topic. Another article came out uh, yesterday saying that uh, there's a new prism leak. Apparently, um, you know, Edward Snowden's just gonna um, you know dribble this stuff out uh, for as long as he needs to, and it says that um, these the NSA gets live notification of email logins, sent messages and chat service usage from all services or any particular ones all of them <laughs> <laughs> or at least the ones that they they've got access to uh, uh well you know <laughs> what what don't they have access to at this point right i suppose yeah so I basically know. you know that that i don't know you know on some of us when we send an email you know it makes a little sound like you know to say it's sent yeah. it you know i think I think I, I, Apple should change that. You know, I, I use Apple, so I use their sound or whatever. I think Is Apple it the, should change the whoosh sound. Yeah, yeah, they should change that to something more appropriate. You know, like copy. You know, like copy to the C, to the NSA or something. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so there's so there's some guy sitting in some desk somewhere in some windowless building who gets not only sounds when he sends email, but he gets sounds when you send email also. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just insane, isn't it? 
Yeah, it's it's crazy. I mean, I can't I can't believe. I mean, I can believe it, but yeah, I. Oh. <laughs> It's insane. And, um, you know, every day it gets more serious because, uh, you know, um, what's next? I mean, I think all of us have been asking ourselves what's next for the last uh, 20 years or so. Yeah. And uh, what's next, you know, and then, you know, to the to those of our listeners who are not already engaged in agorism or other forms of, um, you know, building the new society, a new power base, um, you know, what you waiting for? <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, this this situation is getting more extreme by the day, and when it gets to the point where we can't communicate um, because everything is is surveilled, uh, you know, or what what then? What then? You know, you, you know, I we could probably go on and on about this, but um, I saw an article that you posted, I think, yesterday um, about how Ecuador offered money to the U.S. for human rights training. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was awesome. Those guys in Ecuador are pretty ballsy. I like yeah, that. Um, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll kind of want to move there. <laughs> but yeah, here's this tiny country basically needling the, the U.S. I thought that was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Although I wouldn't want to live there, really. I don't have a very positive impression of, of the, the actual living no. conditions, no. And I live next yeah. to Colombia, so... Okay, yeah, I, I don't know much about them other than they actually had the balls to come out and say, you know, you guys are doing these terrible things, and instead of taking your money in foreign aid, we're willing to offer you some to train you how to be better. <laughs> yeah, I, I really appreciated that. I thought that was great. Yeah, like that, most countries just, they're not so bold as to just come right out and say that in public, so I thought that was fantastic. Yeah. So our main topic, are libertarians too selfish? Um, and you suggested this topic, John. I did. I saw your uh, Liberty Talking Points video. It was probably two weeks ago now, I think it was, mm -hmm. yeah. um, where you, you were talking about um, how libertarians are always saying me, me, me um, about money and taxes kind of thing and trying to convince people that taxes are wrong because they're theft and that's my money and I should be able to do whatever I want with it. Yeah. And I I think that that's... I don't want to say that you're wrong. That may be a good way to reach people as far as activism goes. Um, but to me, I think that, that that trying to explain how you might use your money better, does, it addresses the symptom and not the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought it was funny in the video because you said you find it tedious and boring to talk about how the how it's your money and me, me, me all the time. And let's talk about what we could do better with the money. Yeah. And... It was funny because I was sitting there listening going, I find it tedious and boring to talk about how the government's doing such a terrible job. Like, I'm so tired of talking about that. Yeah, I agree I, with I, that. I'm, I'm almost getting to the point now where people are like, oh, I can't believe this government just did this thing. And I kind of smack my head and I'm like, where have you been? Mm. <laughs> That's what the government does. Yeah, it's like, um, in, you know, I've, I, I like the guys who do cop block, for example, and I respect them a lot. But uh, I, I don't think... You know, I think they are at a certain level of the power and the path to the solution, and they're a little bit stuck there because they're always focusing on, uh, look at this latest case of police, you know, doing what, uh, you know, police do. Mm -hmm. And it, it gets, you know, like I can't, I, you know, you get to a point where you just like can't watch that anymore because um, you can't read that stuff anymore because it's so depressing. And, uh, for example, there's a, actually, um, yeah, there's a friend of mine who was, uh, assaulted last week because he was videotaping. He was just passing by some DEI guys doing something. And, um, he was assaulted by them for, for, for videotaping them. And, uh, another gentleman whom I respect immensely, Carlos Miller, uh, posted the, um, posted that, the video and whatnot to his blog. His photog photography is not a crime blog. But all he did was post it. All, so, I mean, all he did was like, hey, look at this bad thing that the, the, the police are doing to people again. Yeah. But there was no like, hey, this is the way we can solve it. Hey, you can do this to, to help. You know, like it was just like, ugh. you know, so it was like like lowering, you know, people's morale. In my opinion, that's all that does. Unless if you're going to put forth a problem, you also have to suggest a solution or something people can do to help. You know what I mean? Because otherwise yeah. we feel powerless. I've heard people say that and I 
I think that in some cases that's okay, but I don't I don't tend to agree with the fact that you can't point out some problem without also pointing out the solution. I mean, in this case, the government is stealing your money as far as taxes go. I mean, the solution is for them to stop stealing your money. I mean, the the argument doesn't go, some guy shows up at your house and decides, hey, I'm going to steal your TV. And you say, no, that's my TV. And he says, well, I'm going to steal it because I want to show educational videos to orphans in orphanages. And you say, well, no, you can't take my TV because I'm going to learn about how I can start my, I'm going to use it to watch an educational video about how to start my own orphanage. I mean, the argument shouldn't be, I have a better use for my TV than you do, so you can't steal it. The argument should be, that's my property, and you can't steal it because it doesn't belong to you. I mean, there doesn't need to be a solution to that. I mean, The, the, the problem, John, is that that's a tone-deaf argument in today's environment. That on the subject of taxes, the uh, people who are for it are so well entrenched and so insulated in their arguments that they don't hear that. That is... Uh, for them, a non-working argument. And so pu public relations-wise, so philosophically, you're absolutely correct. Uh, but public relations-wise, that is absolutely not helpful because it's simp it doesn't reach the, the people that we need to reach. And it just reinforces our image of being, you know, corporate tycoons who are all me, 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 me. Yeah, I... I don't think I don't think you're going to change somebody's mind who thinks that taking your money and giving it to somebody else. I don't think if they believe that so firmly, I don't think you're going to change their mind by trying to point out that you can do it better. I don't actually need to change their mind. I just need to neutralize um, their argument. So they say. Uh, we have to take your money because we have to do good things with it like X, Y, and Z. And so if I'm like, hey, look, you're doing a crappy job. Yeah. And so and here's my project or this other project that's doing a better job. I'm giving my money to them. Um, and so so then all of a sudden, it's not a David and Goliath thing where we have Mr. Rich, you know, deep pockets over here on one side saying me, 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 me. And on the other side, little poor guy uh, with uh, no money being like, hey, can, can somebody help me? You know, now well, it's like it's it's more equal. And so they can't they can't win in the public relations arena. Not so easily. Well, they least. could if they keep taking your money and then they give it to those people. So, I mean, the argument's going to go, but the they're not going to go. That. If we don't take if we don't take your money, then you might not give your money to some kind of welfare system. So we need to take it. And if you have a better place for us to send it, we can talk about that. But no, we're but still taking your money. No, but if we show that we're doing it all, all on our lonesome, then it neutralizes their argument. And the government, like, let's say housing, yeah? So, for example, the government is, absorbs a whole bunch of money on the topic of housing and outputs very little actual decent housing. But, for example, um, Habitat for Humanity, they receive uh, reasonable amounts of money and they input lots and lots of housing, and so this is something that we and for, and they're very you know associated with people on the left. So this is something that we can leverage to neutralize uh, people on the left who want to take you know want to increase taxes or want to continue taxes. Because we're like, hey, these guys are doing a better job, so we should you know you should uh, reduce our taxes, eliminate the government thing because it's not working, and we'll just send our money over here. And look, we're already sending our money over here, and we already did this X, Y, and Z. So if we're building houses, who's going to feed people then? I mean, my argument is why doesn't the government just funnel money towards Habitat for Humanity then if they're doing such a great job? Be the, they'll never do that because – Why not? Because that, turn, that, that exposes the fact that they are simply money channelers. Um, and I mean that reduces their power because their power is in, hey – we're this black box and we work this magic inside this box and we make wonderful things happen. And so if that turns into just, hey, we receive your money and we receive $100 and uh, $35 comes out and goes to uh, Habitat for Humanity, I mean, the scam is so obvious. Um, and what's more, they can't, you know, Habitat for Humanity is mostly volunteer uh, labor. And so they can't funnel contracts to, um, you know, private corporations 
who then funnel, um, you know, campaign donations back to the politicians. You know what I mean? Makes sense. You mean so the polit- the politicians wouldn't benefit from funneling the money to Habitat for Humanity? The bureaucrats, the corporations, none of them, none of them would benefit from that. Only people in need of a house and uh, Habitat Humanity as an organization would benefit. Yeah, I, I can't, I can't, for me, I mean, now, now we've stumbled onto the reason I don't do activism is I can't get past the fact that, that we're addressing the symptom instead of the problem. Well, you need to get past that because, um, you know, when the, the rumbling hordes of, uh, looters come, they don't care that your argument is philosophically or logically sound. Um, people are, we are mostly emotional animals and we have to reach people on an emotional basis. Just as the certain people make a big fuss, oh, they're cutting funding to the babies. No. So we have to be like, hey, when you raise our taxes, you're cutting our funding to Habitat for Humanity and fewer people are going to have houses. I mean, we have to turn their own tactic back around at them in a way that helps uh, build, um, you know, sustainable private sector uh, alternatives to government and help grows that sector, that power base, and helps weaken the government power base. Does, is, do you, I mean, I don't see that as being effective, though. I mean, how... If it how, works for them, why wouldn't it work for us? It works for them because they're going to take your money whether you like it or not. <laughs> well... But taxes have been reduced in the past and they can be increased. And we absolutely must, you know, this, this is something that uh, dogs, libertarians, this um, image of us being, you know, greedy uh, corporate types who uh, basically want to say to the poor, fuck off and die. And uh, that, is, that is a big barrier to acceptance um, of libertarianism that we need to get past. We need to show that that libertarianism does have a social safety net, um, and we need to show it now in real life, not, you know, something, you know, not words on a paper, not a a theory. You know, we need to show it actually working. Yeah, but the – so I agree with that. I agree that you need to show libertarianism working, but I – I have a problem when you want to put that argument together with here's why you need to stop stealing my money. Because, Why? like I said, b- because that addresses the symptom and not the problem. You're basically saying, stop stealing my money because I can do good things with it if you weren't stealing it from me. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, I mean, that's the stage we're at. We're, we're not I, at the stage where we're having re- reasoned debates. I mean, this is not uh, the Agora in ancient Rome. Uh, you know, we're not debating with Socrates here. We're debating with a bunch of people who have been corralled into crappy jobs where they work uh, too many hours a day. Uh, they spend their free time on their TV. They're not particularly well educated, and um, they're easily swayed one way or another uh, by simplistic arguments that uh, people in the state are very adept at using. Yeah, so I'm, we need I'm... to get smart because before anything, I mean, the the philosophical uh, aspect of libertarianism is our foundation, and it's a rock hard foundation. But we need a, a public relations, uh, just like you know the the Democrats and the Republicans and their talking points and whatnot. We need to have that same operation because we will not prevail on logic alone. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not saying that that you're. I'm not saying that you're wrong on the PR aspect. What I'm saying is that I can't get past that, at least personally. It seems uh, to me that- like that, and you're not the only one. But it seems to me like that thing is like. Oh, I don't want to get my hands dirty, you know, and I, you know, like we're going to have to get our hands dirty. No, no, not, not for, well, I mean, maybe this is what you're suggesting, but for me, it's, I, I can't get past that in my own head. I just, I mean, I have to sleep with myself, you know, I have to go to sleep at night kind of thing. And I don't feel very good about myself if I have to go out and essentially in my mind, lie to somebody to make, lie. Them, you know, well, what, 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 where, what, well, huh? where's there a well, lie like, in here? Well, I direct a bunch of my money towards charitable operations as it is now. I don't plan to direct any more of it if the government stops stealing my money. So and That's the, not to say that I won't, but I don't necessarily plan to. So I don't want to go out to somebody and say, you need to stop stealing my money because if you did, I could direct even more towards these charitable things. 
But you could. But look at it I this could, way. But most, people, not... most people pay around thir- – a lot of people, not most, but a lot of people pay around 30% of their income to the government. And so they're left with um, do you around... have Do you have a website that talks about that? I've seen you throw that number around before. That's what, that's what they always charge me. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if it's going up or down. But anyway. I was just curious because I don't pay anywhere near that rate. So I was just wondering who the people are that are paying that rate. Uh, well, if you – I mean you go in and you take a job and they immediately take 30% out. Well, you can, you, can, you can play with the withholdings and stuff and get them to take far less than that, which is what I end up doing. Mm-hmm. Well, anyway, let's say you they take 20. Let's say they take 20 and you keep 80. And so basically, if you get that 20 back, that's like getting a uh, 25% raise. So you're telling me if you have 25% more take-home uh, uh, pay, that you are not going to be very willing and open to uh, help more people who genuinely need help. No, me, me, me. <laughs> oh. No, and that's what that's what I'm saying is I, I'm not I'm not saying that if I had another well for me it's not going to be another twenty percent. Um, but a lot of people, for example, even um, there was um, I saw a case a few years ago. I think it was Warren Buffett, where he his he claimed his tax rate was like sixteen percent at the end of the day, but his uh-huh. secretary paid twenty one. Right. And so, you know, 20 is, is I think, a very uh, factual number. You know, if Warren Buffett's secretary is paying 20%, I mean, that's, that's a very factual number. But in any yeah, well, case, no matter, I mean, it could be a 10% de facto raise in, 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 I mean, yes or no. If you had more money, would you or would you not be, be very open to the idea of helping people who needed help with it, well, with some first, part of it? Well, yes or no? All, no, but yes or no? Yes or no? Y- y- yes. All right. See? See? See what I'm saying? This is exactly my point. But to 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 Warren Buffett's argument, I wonder, I wonder if he's playing funny with his numbers. Um, when we get our taxes done, our tax people, she hands us a sheet of paper that shows us, you know, here's your top line. Here's all these deductions, blah, 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 all the way down the sheet. And when it gets down to the bottom, you know, it says something like, all right, you paid... 12% or 15% or 20% or whatever the number is, right? But it turns out that that number actually reflects having like social security and that kind of stuff taken out, mm-hmm. you know, and a bunch of deductions that have already been taken out. So the percentage that you paid in taxes is actually of this lower number. Oh, so well, the percentage consider... looks higher, but in practice, it turns out it's not. No, but for me, social security and all that other crap is taxes just the same. Yeah. Also, I, you I have, have to factor to in with... sales tax. You have to factor in property tax. You have to factor in all the ridiculous fees and things that uh, you know go into um, all the different uh, products and services that we use. So, if that stuff went away, though, wouldn't you see prices start to rise as well? I mean, wouldn't you basically have more dollars chasing the same amount of goods, and so prices would rise to match whatever that is, whatever the difference is? Um, who knows? It's a, certainly a possibility. Although, of course, the government would stop consuming, and they consume enormous amounts of things. So it that's may, may as well balance itself out. You know, you never that's, know. That's very true. I hadn't really considered that. Hmm. So, yeah, so I, I'm so not I don't saying you're wrong, and you're lie. far better. There's no lie yeah. here, you know. I mean, I there, know if I had more money, uh, there have been times when I was a little more flush with cash in my life, and I started, you know, sending money to, to more charities and, you know, paying a membership in the ACLU and sending money to Habitat for Humanity and sponsoring open source uh, uh, software projects and whatnot. So I, I don't see a lie here at all. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's a lot. Maybe lie was a little too strong a word, but. You know, for for me personally, I I don't feel very good going out and being like, hey, let me keep my money and I can do this better thing with it, unless I really intend to go do that better thing with it. Well, the alternative is just to continue with the same old, same old of, hey, it's my money, it's my money, you know, it's my money, which doesn't work. It's a tired argument. It doesn't work. Yeah, and um, I think and we need to, you know, we have a responsibility. Uh, it may be uncomfortable for us, maybe uncomfortable for our egos or whatnot. But we have a responsibility, um, not just to ourselves, 
uh, but also to our children, uh, to give them a better world, a world that's uh, safer, more just, more free, and even a more urgent responsibility to the victims of statism uh, here, you know, at home and abroad, in the, the the people who are in prison for victimless crimes, the people that police kill and hurt, the, the lives they ruin, uh, the victims of war overseas, the children that drones are killing on a daily basis uh, or weekly basis. I mean, we have a serious responsibility here. Uh, not everybody knows about libertarianism. Not everybody knows about freedom. Not everybody understands it. And we are the people who do. And if we don't take the steps necessary to remedy this situation, to put an end to this um, you know, evil empire that the United States has turned into, um, then nobody else is going to do it. And we're going to pass along to our deathbeds and we're going to, and we're going to be, you know, our grandkids are going to be in the same situation we are now. And they're going to be like, Hey, how come you didn't take care of it? How come I have to deal with it now when it's 10 times worse? You know, it was much easier for you back in 2013, but for me here in 2063, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I can't even speak out, you know? Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not terribly concerned about that. Um, you know, <laughs> well, only for the reason that I'm not mad at my grandparents that they didn't do something when it was even easier for them. Well, you know, I, I may not be angry, uh, with them, but I am kind of like, you know, uh, you know, I think my life and my son's life could have been radically different if they had, um, you know, taken up the challenge when it was their turn. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm upset at the people who've imposed that though. I'm not upset at the people who didn't do enough in somebody's mind to fight back against it. Well, I mean, I think the, 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 um, the I mean, fault lies equally with both sides. You know, if, if the person who, who goes, who oversteps his bounds to do something wrong is in the wrong, but the person who stands there passively and takes it and cooperates with it is, is, is equally in the wrong. Um, you know, if, cooperates if, with it, perhaps. Yeah. I mean, if there's, if you have a gun to your head, that's one thing. Um, but if you don't, you know, for example, all the people who went along with the institution of, uh, you know, automatic withholding, I mean, that, you know, hello. I mean, I know they pulled that in the middle of World War II. I mean, uh, you know, they had everybody out there in the trenches and whatnot. I mean, it was kind of hard to resist that. Um, <laughs> but still, I mean, and there have been so many other things that have come along the road where people have stood by quietly and haven't released, you know, done anything about it. And I think we have to look forward to the future and, and ask where we're going. And, you know, five years from now, am I going to be happy with the things that I did over, over these, you know, these coming five years? Um, you know, am I going to be happy with myself? And am I going to be able to look myself in the mirror and say, I did everything I did. I, See, I, I did everything a, that I could. I have a problem even faulting the people who went along with automatic withholding. I mean, if you're going to take the line that taxes are okay, then why, what's the problem with automatic holding? You know, if taxes are good and okay, then why can't the government get paid on a weekly or monthly or whatever basis the same way you and I do? Mm, but taxes are not okay. They are, but that's my point. Why aren't we arguing that taxes aren't okay? Like, why are we suddenly mad at our grandparents or whoever because they didn't fight back against automatic withholding i mean shouldn't we because be mad at them that they didn't fight back against taxes in the first place because they they allowed the government to take another step forward um but the government's already there in terms of taxes they've already got people convinced taxes are okay well yeah but, I mean, that was the foundational so step but still right, i mean so getting mad about automatic withholding is addressing a symptom not the actual problem itself uh, you know <laughs> but it was it it is another problem uh, and if it had been stopped, we wouldn't be in the situation we are today. In what sense? Well, they, because the government it just receives its money, I mean, automatically, uh, you know, every every quarter. Right. I mean, it's, that's incredibly empowering for them, for them to, to get that money every quarter and not have to wait for it. And not right. have to depend... Uh, you know, if I have a job and I, I, I'm like, you know, I want to be a tax pro protester now and I don't want to pay them. Well, I don't have that choice, you know, whereas before I did. Oh, so somebody's stealing your money and you're mad about it. <laughs> mm. I mean, they, ha they have to be fought on all fronts. 
I I understand, but and it's, it's not gonna. Uh, we're not gonna for, be like tomorrow. You know, like using the same old arguments. Uh, it's hard. We're not like gonna said, defeat taxation tomorrow. I mean, yeah, but I don't. It think... all happens incrementally, and it it has to be fought both incrementally and you know on a strike the root basis. But yeah, and strike perhaps the root is too um, extreme for some people. They they just I think don't. I think we've it. gotten we've gotten into why I develop software, or at least the personality traits that lead to being able to be good at developing software. I. I can't stand when people come, like I said earlier, I find it tedious and boring when people want to come and be like, look at this horrible thing that the government does. Or, you know, I can't, I can't stand automatic withholding. You know, these are all symptoms of some other problem. And you don't solve the problem by addressing the symptoms. You just put Band-Aids on it. So I don't think like that's, I said, when that's you... really true. Look at WikiLeaks. They, they, they addressed um, a symptom, which is, um, you know, some certain secrets that the government has and that has done um they've done an enormous service in putting chinks in the, the government's armor uh look at snowden i mean he didn't come out and say you know government is wrong taxation is a uh, force no he was like hey the government's spying on you and so it's a chink in the government's armor because it's right uh, and so upset a lot of out, people it, it addressed the people symptom are clamoring for but it has been quite hearings. effective it has been you know before we can um, do away with government and replace it with something else. It has to be discredited. It has to be shown to be uh, harmful or ineffective or wasteful. I mean, all the, you know, the symptoms have to be addressed. You can't just go into the U.S. Senate and be like, "Taxation is forced," and everybody's like, "Oh, you're right." You know, but let's let's abolish taxation. Uh, you can't even go into a, a Kiwanis club or a small business meeting and do that because. It doesn't work. I mean, it's very important to have the ideological clarity of knowing in your heart that taxation is force. But, um, you know, waging the public relations battle to get people to understand that and to back off of it is much more complicated. And we have to get our hands dirty when we do that, whether we like it or not. That's been going on for forever, though. I mean, you and I read stories every day about how the government's inefficient and corrupt and... You know, this NSA thing's going on, and so everybody's like, oh, well, we need to hold these people to account, which means Congress is going to hold hearings, which everybody knows are nothing more than opportunities for Congress to stand up and grandstand and, you know, make themselves look important. I mean, I don't know how much more inefficient or corrupt we can make this system look. You know, people are clamoring for reforms for the NSA. It's, it's you know, the government will eventually pass some law. I mean, it was like we were talking about a couple weeks ago when we first started talking about this. The whole PRISM thing grew out of FISA, whose entire purpose was to prevent this very thing from happening. Which is exactly, exactly why it is so urgent and critical right now, right this very moment, that we build and promote alternatives to government. Because... Uh, you know, to take down something evil, I mean, is is a uh, at least on a superficial level a two step process. First, you have to show that it's evil, and once you've shown that it's evil, people are kind of like, okay, but now what? And then you have to give them the now what, which is why it's so critical that um, you know instead of you know that in addition to saying taxation is wrong, we also have to say you know because people are like tech you know you're like taxation's wrong. And people are like, well, that may or may not be true, but we still need it to pay for the roads and then the social safety net and all this stuff. And so now what? And then you're like, okay, Habitat for Humanity, this organization, that organization, this mutual aid society. And they're like, oh, but that's all stuff in books from 100 years ago. And you're like, no, they're working right now. Take a look but at these websites. What but that's my point is habitat for humanity exists private toll roads exist and you point these things out to people and they say okay well that's all fine and good but we still need more money to do this more stuff it doesn't end and i don't think you solve this problem or address it by saying i can set up an even another charity if you'll let me keep more of my money i think that you're right we need to set up other things to um sorry i lost the word i was looking for I mean, we need to set up other organizations and means to help people like you're suggesting but i don't the problem i have is when you suddenly have put the two arguments together that i should be able to keep more of my money because i can do these better things with it well, i think with both of those are true but i don't think that they have to be they don't have to go hand in hand with each other 
there will always be diehards who um, will defend the state to the last. I mean, look at the, the American Revolution. At least um, 30 or 40 percent of the population were loyalists. Um, but they, they're not important, and they don't have to be convinced. Every time that there is a, a conversation in a public place about these things, there are people who are silent. They don't say anything, but they are listening, and they are being reached on one level or another. And, um, you know, so the diehards can go on indefinitely, but we have to go on indefinitely too, because every time we open our mouths, we're making people question something, and we're making progress. Yeah, I I agree with you on that point. Like I said, my problem is my problem is at least in the particular video that you gave that the argument for why you should be able to give able to keep more of your money is because you can do something better with it. And my problem with that argument is on the basis of somebody's committed a crime against you and you shouldn't have to prove that if they don't commit that crime, you'll do something better with whatever it is they stole from you. And the well, fact the thing is, is, it's your, it's your property, and I understand it, that it's, it's a public relations argument. But like it's, it's like I said, you, we're we're basically getting into my personality, and I I have a problem personally doing that kind of thing because I think it addresses the symptom and not the problem. And I think on some certain level, it's it's intellectually dishonest. Maybe you know, like I said, maybe it's not an outright lie, but it's dishonest for me to go out and say I want to do this better thing, and if you just let me keep more of my money. Then I'll go do this better thing. But you yourself said that if um, you know you were able to get back those funds that the government was stealing from you, that you would be very open to the possibility of helping more people who needed and help. And I probably would, but like so I then said, where I don't does think the intellectual should... dishonesty enter into the conversation? I shouldn't have to go and tell somebody I'm going to do some better thing for humanity if I was able to keep more of my money. The fact is somebody's committed some kind of crime against me, and I shouldn't have to give a reason for why they shouldn't commit that crime. Well, they shouldn't I, I, commit that crime because it's a crime. I shouldn't period. have to explain why it's wrong to uh, kill children with drones. I shouldn't have to explain why it's wrong to put people in a cage for growing a plant. Uh, there are many, many things that I shouldn't have to explain. But the fact is that I do have to explain them, and if I don't, it's going to continue and it's going to get worse. And so I have a responsibility to do it, and whether I don't think that that's involves the same getting my hands dirty or not, whether I like it or not. I mean, that's we have you're a responsibility. Talking, we have a historical about, responsibility to end the state in our lifetime and bring about uh, a better situation. That's not the argument I'm making. You're not explaining why taxes are wrong. You're explaining why people shouldn't collect their your taxes. But the, why to, why taxation is force? I mean, that is. Um, that has been explained ad nauseum. I mean, it doesn't well, that's have my, and to that's be my... enforced. I mean, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, harped on really very much anymore. I mean, people even have websites, taxation is forced. I mean, you know, you can be like, you know, uh, taxation is obviously wrong. You know, Google taxation is forced. Um, but in addition to that, if you're worried about the social safety net thing, well, X, Y, and Z, you know. That's fine if you want to that, – like I said, I'm fine if you want to say that. If you want to say taxation is wrong and if you are, your problem with taxes is you feel like there's no social safety net, well, here's all these private organizations that do social safety net type of operations. That's fine to me. My problem comes when you put those together and tie them together, i.e. taxation is wrong because you're taking money away from these private organizations that do this kind of thing. But that's, that's where the real power comes in because that um, ham, hamstrings – their attack because their attack is based on the so-called greater good. You know, we have to tax for the greater good, you know, because, you know, everybody needs these things. And so if you say, well, the greater good is better served by these other things, these private alternatives of which I personally am involved in some of them to one extent or another, um, then you totally hamstring their argument. They have no argument left because you, your alternative is better serving the so-called greater good. Right. And what that's my point. That's the point I was making earlier. I agree with you. These things exist and they're already out there, but it doesn't seem to be having any effect the same way, you know, this Edward Snowden has exposed the NSA and people are just like, let's hold some hearings and pass some new laws against this kind of stuff. Nobody's out there going, this thing is wrong and let's get rid of it. 
Yes, there are some people doing it, but not enough. Because well, libertarians are, are not people who public relations before. savvy. We're, we're not public relations savvy. A, as a general statement about I mean, we're not the group, good at lying to people. We come on. Public relations is not lying. Um, <laughs> as a general we have group, to agree to disagree there. As a group, I do public relations, and I do public I relations for libertarians. Um, and I take great pride in the work that I do. And but I think as you're a very good at it. I don't mean to insult you. As a general statement, John. Libertarians are book savvy. We're logical and we're, we can, you know, prove X, Y, and Z up and down all day long. But the great majority of the population are very emotional people. And, um, you know, we can sit in our corners with our books and, and claim that we're right all day long, but it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't actually impact the uh, reality of day-to-day -day life. It doesn't help the children who are being assassinated in, in Palestine or in Pakistan. Uh, it doesn't get anybody out of a cage who doesn't belong there. Um, and so, you know, if, if we actually believe what we really believe, then I have to challenge everybody listening to this to practice that and go out and make Make it happen, you know, and get your hands dirty because we do have a historical responsibility here because we have the knowledge and we have the ability to make something happen. And again, that's not the argument that I'm making. I'm not saying that these things aren't wrong and I'm not saying we shouldn't go out and explain why they're wrong. I'm saying that we don't explain why they're wrong by showing that something better could become could go on if these things weren't happening. I think I think if you had a sales experience, you you would understand how important it is um, to you know when when you're tearing something down, you have to you know put something else in its place. I mean, well, that's, that's just so is, basic. That's and this is why basic. I don't do sales or PR or marketing. But unfortunately, ninety percent of life is sales. I mean, everything is sales. Interpersonal relations are sales. Um, and so, um, you know, if, if we, if we close ourselves off, then that radically limits our life potential. And for those of us who are parents, it also limits the potential of our children because of course they their principal manner of learning from us is by, by example, by seeing our example. Yeah, I, I'm happy to talk to people. I'm happy to explain my point of view to them. I mean, I'll give people all day long if they want, you know, anybody who's most people don't want to hear me talk about this kind of stuff. So anybody who does, they can have my undivided attention for as long as they want to listen and be civil and, you know, have a conversation about it. That's not really the problem. My, like I said, my problem is just trying to explain that not, you know, these people are, there's a crime being committed and at least in your video, what I took away from that is your argument against this crime isn't that it's a crime and explaining why it's a crime. It's that you shouldn't commit this crime because I can do something better if you hadn't stolen from me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and I have a problem with that on an intellectual level. It's a and crime. That's... And I'm just saying we've beaten that point to death. That, that point. Well, apparently we haven't because it's still going on. <laughs> well, just, we, I mean, we've beaten that argument to death. Um, everybody knows that argument, especially now with uh, the popularity of Ayn Rand. Um, there are people in the U.S. Senate who know it, but they don't – it hasn't swayed them to action or it hasn't neutralized their ability to carry out um, the taxation agenda. I don't think I don't think you have reached them. I talked to plenty of people who think, OK, well, taxation is forced, but the government has this authority under the Constitution or whatever other social construct or whatever you want to. But exactly. Exist. That's exactly my point. They understand it's forced, but they think it's OK because it's for something good. And right, so, if, so we show, you under, if we show so that we can address... do something better with less money in a, you know, in our way. Then it neutralizes that argument. It renders that argument obsolete. Their argument. It renders their argument obsolete. It's not convincing in the court of public opinion anymore. Yeah, but then again, that's that's that kind of goes back to this self ownership debate we had. I mean, do our rights are our rights only what we can convince others of? Yeah, and that, that yeah, doesn't basically. really sit right with me either. Well, I mean, but that I mean, we haven't. You know, for example, look at the the whole the whole gun thing. Um, where people were either unable or unwilling to convince um, others of their, you know, unlimited right to keep and bear arms, 
there have been considerable restrictions um, put in place on that. And now that that um, there is a huge lobby behind, um, you know, gun rights, uh, it's moving in the other direction, in totally the other direction, even in the face of this whole uh, Newtown thing, which you would think, I mean, in the 1980s or 90s, that would have resulted in, um, you know, uh, some serious uh, anti-gun legislation. I, I think it's a great, it's almost a miracle that it didn't result in any serious anti-gun legislation, um, you know, this time around. And that's because there's so many people out there who are so organized and so articulate and so well-versed in all the different arguments um, in favor of unlimited or at least, you know, not seriously limited uh, right, gun rights. Yeah, I mean, you, you you stumbled. Maybe maybe you want to call it a personality flaw if you want, but I find the whole I find that whole system offensive to me. You know, the government's going to take my money from me and then pass a bunch of laws and say you can't have guns. And so then here comes the NRA, and they say, hey, pay us a bunch of money so we can go fight this organization and help protect your gun rights. And like, well, I just it is distasteful. <laughs> it's I mean, distasteful, yeah, like, but that's the world it, we live in. And if we want to get to a better one, um, then we're going to have to hold our noses and uh, get our hands dirty. I I don't disagree with you, at least especially not on for that those point. of us who are parents. I mean, we have a greater incentive to, um, you know, if for people who aren't parents or maybe are old people or never want to be parents. I mean, you may be, you may be like, okay, well, I can go find my quiet corner and hide in it. But for those of us who are parents, um, you know, the incentive, the um, the urgency is so much greater. Yeah, I I have a hard time just not being like, you know what, people, you fuck off. This is all wrong, and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to explain to you how it could be better. It's just wrong, and that's the end of it. I have a hard time not just getting into that mindset. Yeah, I, I've had. You know, I mean, I I felt that way too. But the thing is that, um, you know, I imagine, you know, my son in the same situation uh, when he's older. And I don't want him to be in that situation where he has to kind of, you know, deny his own um, his own truth in order to just get along in society, because that's 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 pretty soul crushing. Um, and I, I want something better for him. Yeah, I'm I yeah, I'm not not disagreeing with you on that point. All right. Well, <laughs> I think we had a good conversation. We're a little bit over. Um All right. Yeah. So, um but I, I think it was a really good conversation. We both uh you know, we we we, we went pretty gung ho into it. So. <laughs> So for those of you uh who are still with us, it would be really really nice if um you could uh, come up with a question for us and then give us a call and uh, record it uh, on our voicemail. The number for that is 641-715-3900, extension 255-888. It would also be really cool if you could go to AYMFL.com slash T-A-O-L. Those are the initials for Arm Your Mind for Liberty and The Art of Liberty. And if you could go and hit the subscribe with iTunes button and subscribe to us there. And, uh, you know, if you feel like, um, you know, we're doing something valuable here, maybe you could even go into iTunes and write us a, a little review and give us a rating because that will help us reach even more people. Uh, with our our conversations, which I think are pretty interesting, you know, it's not your standard uh, libertarian fair. Um, and you know, we're also on YouTube, and so you you know, at the AYMFL dot com site, um, you can find the link to the YouTube video for this uh, for this episode. And so, you know, maybe you can like it and share it around, and you know, let people know about what we're doing, so that we can uh, you know have a greater influence and reach more people with the uh, message of liberty. What do you think, John? I think that's a fantastic idea. You know, I was going to tell you, I actually, I never listened to our podcast, mostly because I hate hearing myself talk. And I actually listened to our last one. And I actually found it really interesting to listen to it, even though I took part in the conversation. So <laughs> I hope, I hope, I figure, you know, if I can find it interesting, maybe there's other people out there who do too. But yeah, definitely send us a comment or question. I think um, more, more listener interaction would be awesome. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It gives us more to talk about. 
and it raises our morale and it makes us feel like, you know, we're not just talking into empty air here. And uh, cause we do need your support. It's not, this is not a one way thing. Uh, this is a two way conversation. You know, the, the idea is not for us to be, you know, uh, like a Rush Limbaugh, you know, who just, you know, spouts his own version of the truth and doesn't want to hear from anybody else. No, we would like to have a conversation. And uh, whether you agree with us or not, you know, for example, that episode about uh, the military where Wendy called in and left us a question, a uh, challenging question. Uh, that was really cool. And that's now our second most popular episode. Nice. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening and have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs>